And it's John. And Kendall. And we're the Antonellis of Antonellis Cheese Shop. Here in Austin, Texas. And this is our uh, video content for our Cheese 101. So when we first opened the business um, in 2010, a couple weeks before, we didn't even have an idea of how we were going to talk about cheese. And in that moment, about a week before we opened, we finally came up with what we call our seven styles of cheese. So there are numerous ways to classify, categorize, familiarize yourself with cheese. Some of it gets really nuanced about cooked, pressed, and how you treat the curd. We came up with, a, we adopted and adapted what we call the seven styles of cheese. So we're gonna take you through each style based off of the defining characteristics really of that style of cheese and what we love about it. And whether you have three of these categories in front of you or all seven, whether you have pairings that came right out of your fridge or pairings provided by us, the goal here is to just have fun, relax. It's just cheese, it's not overly serious. Uh, it's all tasty um, and what we like to think is that when we're on this journey together, we're just exploring. And so um, make sure your cheese has come to room temperature. If you haven't watched the plating video, go ahead and do that now. And, uh, and set yourself up for success and for a real enjoyable time because we love our intro to cheese. Uh, we love our styles of cheese and we hope you do too. Get ready to enjoy y'all. All right, y'all. The world of artisanal foods is an amazing, beautiful thing. But one thing that irks us as cheesemongers is when we see people go and they go to wine tastings or they go to beer tastings and they take their time and they swirl it around and they smell it and then they drink it and then they think about it and all these things. And then they like toothpick a piece of cheese, pop it in and keep going. So there's so much labor of love and work. And in fact, hands have often touched these cheeses many more times than they have certain bottles of wine. Sorry, wine industry, we're not creating competition. All of that is to say, all of these artisanal foods deserve to be treated and respected. And that kind of sounds like I'm on a soapbox. It's really not about that. It's about you getting the best enjoyment and maximum pleasure out of it. So we like to say, as we go through any tastings, we slow down and we eat mindfully and we really assess the, each one of those process, products. So for us, that's about engaging all five senses. Um, if a squeaky cheese curd doesn't squeak, is it really a squeaky cheese curd? Yeah, so use your ears when eating. Um, like, a, you know when you eat a stale potato chip, how it tastes different? Nothing has changed about the flavor. It's just that the perception of that flavor is different because it's stale no and not crunchy. Anymore. So yeah. listen, visually look at it. What does it tell you? We're gonna learn a lot in the world of cheese about it, but what color is it? Is it dry? Is it wet looking? Is it creamy? Is it crumbly? All of those things, are there molds on it, are gonna tell you a lot about how that flavor is gonna be before you ever even get there. Sight, sound. Touch, play with your food, because at the end of the day, texture can give you some amazing cues to what you're going to experience. We're gonna talk about semi-soft, firm, and hard cheeses later. If a cheese is semi-soft, we know that it hasn't developed as many complex flavors as say the hard version of that same cheese. And you can also think about touch on your palate and incorporating texture with your pairings. So something crunchy. Oh, like a crunchy okra or. And something smooth and silken and creamy like honey. So creating that, um, so we got, oh, an aroma. Well, we haven't done taste and aroma yet. Yes. So the two biggies, right? When we're ever, ever talking about food, the two biggies, do you want to take it or do you want me to? Yeah, so we've talked about when you're doing any sort of tasting, try to engage all five senses, sight, smell, sound, taste, and touch. Specifically, let's break down flavor. Where does flavor come from? And we like to do a little ridiculous exercise. John was like, we don't have to do it on camera. And I was like, yeah, we yeah, do. She does. She if we want them to feel ridiculous, we got to feel so ridiculous. So which one of us is tasting? Okay, you talk them through it all and right. I'll taste. So what I want you to do, I like to eat. One of, find a pairing on your plate in front of you. It could be a cracker or it could be a fig. In this case, a, a corn, corn nut. nut, which you'll probably hear the crunch when Kendall bites into it. But what I want you to do is pinch your nose, keep it pinched. Then you can breathe out of your yeah, mouth. Don't pass out. Then take a bite of that, of that food that you got. Oh, there's that crunch. Um, and t pay attention to what's happening on your tongue. Your tongue can experience five things. Salty, sweet, sour, bitter, and umami. So right now you're probably experiencing salt. Yeah, uh, and maybe umami, I don't know, uh, no. And so when you're like, okay, I really, I think I know what this thing is, unpinch your nose and exhale out through the back of your nostrils. Let the aroma flow over your olfactory and then boom. That those flavors, the organics, they all hit that old factory, and all of a sudden you taste 
uh, hot corn, Frito pie, um, roasted. I get the yeah, roasted, roasted character. Yes. So when I my nose was plugged, I know you have a little bit more of a sensitive palate. You're such a sensitive guy. That's yeah. what I love about you. Um, you're the rom-com. I'm the die-hard lover. Okay, but no, I digress. Your palate is more in tune and you can taste more of those things. But for me, I only get salt. So when I plug my nose, excuse us, I just get salt. Um, that's an off-camera cheesemonger doing the tasting exercise with us and was just blown away by the Ooh, salt flavor. That's, everybody's mind just exploded. Um, when I unleashed my um, nose and I allowed aroma to play a part, that's when I got, it started making me think of popcorn, a Frito pie, really Frito pie. I'm a Texas girl, so that's yeah. what I get. So what is it showing us? It's that flavor is actually taste plus aroma. Your tongue can only taste those five things. So in all the world of what makes all these cheeses different, are sushi different from steak, different from um, a lollipop, all of that really comes through aroma. And in fact, aroma is 80 to 90% sense of your smell, uh, of flavor. What I like about this exercise is if you've been to anything in a tasting and you're like, I don't taste what they're telling us that we're supposed to taste, old science showed that our tongue, we had a tongue map and we all taste sweet, salt, bitter, sour in certain places of our tongue. New science shows that our tongues are like a fingerprint and they're as individual as a fingerprint. So we have different taste buds all over our, not only our tongue, but also the palate, the roof of your mouth and in the back of your throat in different areas for each person. With different sensitivity levels too. Yes, so if you taste something different or you perceive it different, Heck you are yeah. not wrong, you are, you are right. right. And don't listen to anybody tell you otherwise. Now, there are regularly agreed upon flavor compounds and aroma compounds that as you train your palates, palates you get used to and, and get, start to get more knowledgeable about talking about, but still your palate is unique to yourself. If we don't go through anything and say, this is the most popular cheese we have and you don't like it, you do you, all right? There's too many rules in the world, but we do want you to be able to explore the full world of flavor. And that comes from slowing down, enjoying it, all the visual cues, everything that that product has to offer, especially these world of artisanal cheeses, and then making sure that you're incorporating both your tongue and your palate, but also your aroma. Just like when you're sick, if you eat chicken noodle soup, it's about all that sodium. Or when you're high in an airplane, you can't taste as well until they add all the salt to these products. And that's when tomato juice tastes amazing, is when you're up in a, everybody orders tomato juice on an airplane. No, it can't be the tomato oh. juice. It has to be the uh, yeah, yeah. Bloody Mary mixer because it has so much sodium in it and you can actually taste yeah. it. And you need it for that to increase the aroma at that level. So that being said, we hope that you enjoy any tasting you do and you go into it mindfully with whatever you're eating, that you're engaging all five of your senses and taking the time to breathe out while you're tasting because that's the world of flavor. Enjoy, y'all. All right, y'all. One of my favorite things to talk about is what impacts flavor in cheese. And really it comes down to three things. One, what is the species of the animal? Is it cow, goat, sheep, water buffalo, yak, camel? N knack. Oh, it is knack. Knack. We want milk from the lady animals. Yes, a yak is a male, we have since learned. Um, but we have now had knack milk cheese. We have had camel milk cheese. They even make horse milk cheese. So as long as it's a mammal that produces milk, you can make cheese from it. Now, predominantly here in the United States, we have cow's milk. Cow's milk creates the most versatile of cheeses, but often known for being buttery grasses, sweet cream flavors. Goats, uh, we have a lot of goat's milk cheese producers because the animals are smaller and they lactate for a long period of time. And so they're easier to handle, um, easier to start a dairy with. Uh, and that tends to have milk that is um, bright white. Uh, those animals digest the beta carotene that comes through their feed. And so that doesn't make it into their milk like the other animals. It's, it's acidic, very zesty, tangy. minerally tangy, I would say most. It's so good. And, yeah. and then sheep. Sheep, they lactate for a shorter period of time, but they have their milk has more richness to it. Um, and so they get a higher yield than, say, goats. Um, and those are the most decadent of the, the milk types. And then water buffalo, it tends to have the most intense flavor profile, sort of like a wet hay um, flavor profile. Uh, but classically, like a southern Italian, um, like a uh, mozzarella di buffalo. Yeah, and so these are uh, Asiatic water buffalo, not the bison of the American plains. But you brought up a good point that if it's bright white, if it's a young cheese, it's bright white. 
it can be any of the milk types. But if it's aged out and it's bright white, it's always goat's milk cheese. If it's ivory in color, that'll let you know it might be sheep's milk. And if it's more yellow in color, then it's probably more cow's milk cheese. So species, number one. Number two, y'all, is the breed of the species. This can impact it, whether it's milk from Holstein cow, a Jersey cow, or those Montbelliard cows. All of those have different protein ratios and milk compositions. Um, different that, fat molecule sizes. Um, everything is different. They're an entirely different set of animals. And so we have a local goat cheese farmstead producer, farmstead meaning they have their own animals on their farm and make the milk from their animals on the farm to use to make cheese. Um, he only has Nubian goats because he doesn't like any other goat's milk cheese because it's too goaty except for the milk of Nubians, which is more of a sweet. A sweet. We, we yeah, okay, yeah. species, breed, and then seasonality. And seasonality impacts it because of two things. One, where are the animals at in their lactation cycle? Much like a mother's breast milk will taste, she, she provides something different for her, a newborn child a week in than her body will produce two months in, six months in. Animals, it's the same. And also it has to do with their diet and what they're eating on that time of year. Yeah, and so if they're up in the mountains and the alpine pastures eating unplowed grasses and flowers and they have access to an abundant uh, food source, the milk is gonna have a, a deeper quality to it, a, a more intense flavor profiles, more, more flavor profiles. If it's the winter and they're eating dry hay, you know, they're getting actually less moisture in their diet because uh, the grass has got less water in it. Uh, and so that milk comes out much richer and intense. So you can't necessarily make the same style of cheese from those two different types of milk. And so a uh, cheesemaker has to decide how they want to approach it. But that's that's really how... Then, then it's all down to the cheesemaking recipe, the skill of the cheesemaker and affinage and the age of that cheese. But if you're starting with the base block ingredients and what impacts flavor, it's species, breed type, and seasonality. Pairings. Woo! This is some of the most fun stuff that we get to do as professional eaters. People always ask us, how do I pair? What do I pair? And first of all, y'all, the number one rule is have fun with it. We're going to talk you through some suggestions and guidelines, but throw all the rules out the door and break the rules. But, well, okay. One of my favorite initial things was if one product is yum, and another product is yum, yum. likely they're gonna be yummy together. And so let your stomach guide you. We do have people say, I don't like red wine at all, but give me a cheese pairing that will make me like it. Okay, we can probably do that, but life is too short to force yeah. yourself to eat things you don't wanna eat. So with that, here are some though guidelines to go by because whether your package came with some pairings that we've included, or you wanna also get out things from your pantry, that old random jar of jelly, or that beer you got at that craft beer festival, you can pull out and mix and match and create some new flavor combinations. So there are some rules of thumb that the world of food pairings go by. Um, one is complementary flavors, merry complementary flavors. So if we think... Um, uh, sweet with sweet. Yes. Uh, salty with salty. Or a classic example is acid with acid. Now in the world of food, we're not talking about like, ooh, acid indigestion, so don't make it let you cringe. Acid is when you have that perfect bite of food that wets your palate and you've developed saliva and you keep going back for more. So a classic example is these beautiful white wines of the Loire Valley with these beautiful goat's milk cheeses of the Loire Extra Valley. Tangy goats. They're both bright, minerally, and acidic, and so they complement each other. And instead of creating too much of that acid flavor, they kind of mellow out and blend in in this beautiful harmonious dance, and that's marrying like with like. On the opposite side of that... Contrasting. So taking one big flavor profile and uh, contrasting it with something else. So taking a creamy, luscious um, uh, triple creme, for instance, and pairing it with, say, a dark chocolate that has some bitter compounds in it and uh, maybe uh, uh, some umami notes coming from it as well. And so you're taking these two different uh, flavor profiles, bringing them together, and they help uh, bring out a whole new range of flavors in the short and medium and long finish of the uh, And I think the that some classics there for sweet and salty, think Manchego, an aged salty sheep's milk cheese with quince or membrillo paste of this fruit forward paste, or a roquefort. Um, and sauterne is and, a classic. Yeah, with like a fortified sweet. wine or sherry or port. So you're marrying that sweetness with that salt to 
um, mellow down some of that aggressiveness and right. again, bring out new so flavors. Good. And in any of those pairings, complementary or contrasting, and you're thinking of it like a dance partner. You're looking for where neither one outshines the other, but they both highlight each other and create a third beautiful flavor. And sometimes we do that and we're like, oh, this one outshined the other one. And we always try to let the cheese shine if we're gonna do that and fall yeah, back on that. We're cheese people after all. But when we say that, what does that mean to you? It means afterwards you're like, oh, I get the chocolate. Oh, Ooh, there's, the, there's the cheese. Oh, there's the chocolate. And it goes back and forth in that dance on your palate. And that's a All right, so complimentary, contrasting flavors. Another thing, it's an age old rule, what grows together goes together. And so. so yeah, so uh, if uh, community uh, culture develop these two products together in tandem over a long period of time, like champagne and langra, for instance, those are likely really good together because they enjoyed it and they kept wanting more of it. And, and so, it also is kind of the concept of terroir, a specificity of place, that both of those things grew out of that land and that land impacts them, that that land is probably gonna have flavors that work together in both of those products. Yeah. And so really just a, a, another a great um, way to pair is matching intensity with intensity. If you've got a big, bold cheese, you really wanna have a big, bold, flavor otherwise it will just the other thing will get wiped out and the same with uh, like a, a, a soft ripened cheese that's delicate you probably don't want to bring your biggest bold red alongside that you want to match it with intensity you wanna... so intensity often can go with age when we yeah. think about it that way but if you're thinking about like in the world of these seven styles of cheese and these wines from the lightest to most age most ageist to the oldest, you're not going to want to crisscross those. You're going to kind of want to stay even keel in terms of on those spectrums, where is it at in age and what's the flavor intensity of it. So yeah. and the very last part of the pairing recommendation I think we would want to mention is just bubbles. So Always bubbles. Any bubbles. bubbles. Uh, part of if you've watched that tasting video where we uh, Kendall ate her corn nut, you know, what, what, what that's doing we're talking about breathing out through your nose. So sometimes cheese can be very decadent and palate coating and bubbles lift that stuff up off your tongue, clean it and refresh it and get that as aroma compounds up into your nostrils. It kind of does it for you. And pairings are really special, whether it's a wine, a beer, a sparkling water. Yeah, this is not Italian just for those soda. who drink alcohol, y'all. We've done pairings with all different sodas, um, mm -hmm. flavored sparkling waters in the world of that these days. So yeah, it's just about the effervescence of those bubbles, cutting through the fats on your tongue, picking it up, aromatizing, and creating more flavor for you. And it's a great palate cleanser. So have bubbles fun. all the way. So have fun with it, y'all. Just be playful. Hey y'all, we wanted to take a moment to define charcuterie if you eat meat. So first and foremost, we gotta say, Charcuterie does not mean cheese. Um, there's like this whole yep, right TikTok now, verse out there that's 100%. like, I love my charcuterie board. Well, just so you know, I mean, just so we're not on a soapbox about it, are we? I don't know. But charcuterie literally means cooked meat, cooked flesh. It doesn't have anything to do with cheese. So let's talk about the world of charcuterie. So it's, it's probably that you're making cheese and charcuterie boards if you've got meat on it. Um, but so let's break it down on different styles and types of charcuterie. And these are classic. And charcuterie is actually a French word that means that cooked flesh, cooked meat. And it's all about the world of fermented, aged meats that are cured and... Um, and these are historically significant products. If When we traveled in Parma in Italy and you go to one of the main like um, uh, centers of the town, they have these great, it's, uh, I remember the architecture is beautiful. There's carvings around the doorway of a church and it's the seasons of the year. Mm -hmm. And it's gorgeous. part of that is the harvesting of the animals that's spotlighted. And that happens in the fall before the cold winter. And so these meats, how do you maintain and preserve these meats um, using the environment around you so that you can sustain protein sources and, and fats for the long run. Yeah, what something I love about both cheese and meat is while it may have this like bougie pinkies up um, connotation these days, both of them were foods that were of and by and for the people. In fact, people who didn't have resources. And so the reason you made cheese um, was when you had a surplus of milk in the winter, summer and spring and summer months, um, and you didn't want to throw that milk out, you would turn it into cheese. So that then you had a protein source during the winter months when you don't have milk. 
The same is true for the meat. In fact, many of these came as initiatives out of wartime efforts for how do you feed your troops who are long, far away, off in battle, and you, we didn't have refrigeration, and they can't just be harvesting animals there on Thank the spot. You Romans. So yeah. you have Pocket these sausage. ancient curing tactics um, of eating these fermented foods. And yeah, like you said, in the world of cheese and affinage, there are different chambers. You have the same thing in certain meats, and different meats need different styles of uh, in different aging environments. And again, we're, it's all about controlling that moisture loss. And if you have too much moisture in, then the product will rot, which we know is gross. You're like, ew, that's an eating video. Why do I have to hear that? Or if you're doing it right, you're aging it out. Yeah. And so we have some different formats of charcuterie and cured meats to talk you through. And, and the it, most well-known. And they come from the fact that when you're harvesting a whole animal, you want to try to use all of the parts. And so parts like the cheek, the jowl, special is a special type of product that you can buy that's a cured meat. Uh, but the two spotlights uh, that we'll talk about are the whole muscle types and then and this could also be a prosciutto we just didn't grab one right now but that has the hoof on the and hoof the leg on, on. Like so. but so most well known for whole muscle is a prosciutto or that back hind leg yeah um and and they well, there's all different types depending on the region that the tradition started from the culatello uh, is a, the heart of the prosciutto. A lomo uh, is the pork loin. And within that, you have different grades. So you can have the uh, bedico ham with acorn fed pig so that the fat is melts at room temperature. You can have um, the prosciutto de Parma, prosciutto de Sandelle. Jamon de, de Bayonne in the French version. Pr prosciutto Americano here from La Quercia. These, these legs of meat were like, they were hung in attics. They were hung in open air spaces and the tradition would you know the environment would dry it out cool it down keep it safe for human consumption um, and so those were whole muscles coated on the outside and then dried in in total and, and oftentimes i just wanted to point out here's two more um yes and we have a, a speck is this our alto adige, alto adige and then a, a copa here a different type of so meat. all three uh, of these are whole format muscles so it's just what a muscle looks like aging from different, different parts, parts of the pig of the which is why you see different striations um, Brezeola would be a, a beef version from a cow. Um, but people sometimes will ask, or like, ooh, I don't like the fat and I want to peel it off. And we get that. Um, try it with whatever you're eating, because in the artisanal world, oftentimes that fat is fried and it's really delicate. And at room temperature, it'll actually just melt on your palate. And depending on the source of that animal, um, we've actually learned from some local hog producers that because of their diet and what they're rich in, um, the fat doesn't, it isn't stringy or tough or gristly on your palate and instead will literally melt on your palate. So, so give it a try if you want. But those are your whole format muscles. So Why do we like any cured meats? Um, it provides another little bit of salt flavor. Umami um, for sure. Yeah, that umami, that fifth sense, um, and that savoriness. Yeah. And okay. Then with the, a lot of the rest of the pieces of meat, you don't want to actually um, cure them whole and so oftentimes a, a, a salumi maker comes into play where you grind the meat down uh, and you you take some of the fat chunks and mix it together and there's really two types uh, in this family there's the, the large format like, Cor coarse ground yeah you know, coarse ground fine ground and then there's a large format so really big salamis like this comes up yeah in a huge format um, and then uh small salamis and and again these would be made at homes aged in cellars back in the day the small salamis are usually much more fine ground um smaller these are big and, and again that's an intentional decision that the salumi um maker will take in the size of the fat globules what additives or seasonings they want to add into it um, and then what style they want to age it and then and then we have this here this uh, you know, pate style sort of sort Rabbit of a, and pork cheek pate. Um, made to be fairly eaten eaten fairly quickly um, and uh, there's riettes there's a couple of different ways that you can handle the meats um, and for the most part when we talk about our charcuterie producers you know oftentimes it's the quality of the meat that they're sourcing that makes all the difference in the world. Um, so for uh, so they work with different breeds of pigs, whether they're heritage breeds or they're uh, traditional breeds. Um, Again, like, it matters the species of the animal, yeah. the breed, and, and seasonality, and sure. diet, and what they're eating. So enjoy. Some are smoked, some are not. Some have add spices added to it. There's a whole world of charcuterie, and um, it is an amazing thing to explore. 
And I know you were trying to land the plane, honey. Sorry, I just want to say um, what we didn't include here, which does go in charcuterie, is the world of conservas or canned or tinned seafoods because those are also meats. So that's a whole different world you can get into. And then perfect pairings for these are often mustards. Um, pickles, olives. Um, pickles and peppers. meat is one of my favorite things. Yeah, so really play up. And, and cheese. And cheese. Enjoy your charcuterie. All right, y'all. So this is our first cheese style here. This is our fresh cheese category. Fresh cheeses. Woo! These are these these are the best representations of the milk source. So what we want you to experience when you're eating a really great fresh cheese is one, the recipe can make a big difference uh, when when a cheesemaker is making a cheese like ricotta versus chef versus feta. Um, versus mozzarella, paneer, all the, fromage blanc, all of those are um, fresh cheeses. Yeah, and it should taste of the milk source. That's one of the primary things that we want. They are all rindless. Uh, this was sort of the first cheese category ever created. This is when you're basically creating curds and separating Like you whey. at home right now can make a fresh cheese mm -hmm. and eat it immediately. You don't yeah. need to age it out at all. Um, it is delicious as is right there and tastes like a sweet cream. And historically, this was important because it was the, uh, a, a way to take the abundance of milk and try to save it for different um, um, uh, meals throughout the course of a, a week. But it's intended to be eaten within seven to 10 days. So in the best case, historically, that was kind of the idea. Now, you wouldn't throw it out after two or three weeks if it was sustenance in your house, but it's at its highest quality the sooner you eat it. So oftentimes, when we're talking about fresh cheeses in our shop, we are talking about cheeses that we're getting from the dairies week to week and we're trying to sell within seven days. So when somebody comes in and has a bite of a fresh cheese, we can say this was made this week in yeah. many cases. Yeah. And it, again, if not yesterday or the day before. We want you to take it, want you to enjoy it and it should taste like it came from the animal, not like it tastes like the animal. And that's really an important little distinction. Fresh cheeses should be really milky and clean. Give them a smell. So as John said, they're always rindless. They're always bright white in color. So other cheeses, as you'll come to learn in this class, it depends on what milk type. If what do they use? Sheep, cow, water buffalo. All of that will impact the color of the milk in more aged cheeses. But in fresh cheeses, it's always bright white, rindless. Give it a smell. If anything, it smells lactic or like yogurt. Um, and then taste it. And the thing I like about fresh cheeses is people, oh, these are more commonly known for ingredient cheeses. So cooking with them. But if you have a really good show-stopping fresh cheese, you can put it out by itself and eat it as is. And people are like, what, what is this is dreamy that? decadence? This one, for instance, tastes like a, you're eating a cloud. It's a ricotta. Yeah. And, and then we have a marinated feta and we have so a fresh chef. It's interesting here because fresh cheeses have the most moisture in all of the cheese categories. Uh, this one here is actually designed in a can that has holes so it can transport across the country but still the whey, which is highly acidic, can separate away from the curd, so it doesn't uh, create that sort of green apple-y flavor. Uh, so this particular cheese in this packaging, which this is modern packaging, yep. right, is you know really good for two to three weeks. Um, we have the great invention of vacuum sealing, which allows a fresh cheese to last upwards of three, four months in some cases and maintain flavor. And then some of the more traditional methods of aging cheese, this is historically significant, is like a feta in a salt solution can be stored for many, many months and travel across the oceans and the seas. In this case, olive oil works as that um, and I think preservation it's a great, method too. Um, great thing to highlight is that we call these fresh cheeses, we call a barrel aged feta, a brine aged feta, a fresh cheese even though it can be aged out, and that's because you're trying to capture the state of that milk in that early phase. Even though it will, the flavors will change because it'll take on more of that salt and transfer of, of that exchange of that cheese and that paste, but you're still capturing it in that fresh milk essence. Yeah. And really, as a cheese lover, I think it's really important to say that not all of these are created equal, that not one ricotta is the same as the next ricotta, which is the same as the next ricotta, or chev, for instance. You know, um, Ricotta, this is a hand-dipped whole milk ricotta, so it's very luscious on the palate. They make whey-based ricottas, the traditional uh, ricotta I mean, uh, recooked, and that's really grainy. It's a different type of protein that we're trying to capture. Um, and so that is different. Goat cheeses 
you know, I, we, we have so many customers who come in and say, I don't like goat cheese. If we give them a bite of all the goat cheese makers that we feature, and they're like, that's oh, goat cheese? That's, goat that's cheese. amazing. And I think that goes to where it tastes tangy and minerally and bright like a goat's milk cheese, but doesn't taste goaty, those barnyardy goaty flavors that some people have come to um, conflate with a goat's milk cheese. And that does, it doesn't have to taste that way. It's all about the preferences and styles and the make procedures of the cheese maker. And so when you're pro, uh, approaching fresh cheeses uh, for serving, um, definitely don't just consider them like an ingredient cheese. Like Chev shouldn't just be shown on a salad or ricotta cooked in lasagna. Uh, put these things out on their own. Let um, your guests really fall in love with the flavors. Drizzle a little olive oil over the chef, perhaps, or put a few berries next All to the All of ricotta. these I like with fresh fruit or mm -hmm. dried fruit and crudite, so veggies. So all of these are great, just putting out, um, putting it, yep. going savory with a little olive oil and sea salt on it, or like you said, a little honey with it, with some berries. Um, it's so can be good. enjoyed just like that. So enjoy the fresh cheeses. Let us know what you find out. All right, y'all, so we're to our second style of cheeses now. Yummy, yummy, yummy. The Bloomy Rinds. Oh, I love these guys. These are known characteristically for being super creamy, but the most defining aspect of a Bloomy Rind is this white rind on the outside. So it looks like little marshmallows. Um, there are, are cotton-tailed bunnies that are blooming up. They get this name because the molds on the outside actually bloom up when they're aging and you pick them off, pat them down, or you just let them do their thing in a really great aging environment, and they will evenly grow all the way around. Uh, you're flipping it, you're rotating it, you're making sure they get all the right conditions they need to bloom and to thrive. Well, uh, it's like the cutest thing in the world when you walk into a, a aging room and they haven't yet gotten around to the wheels to pat the down. It's like bad oh, hair days with bad like all these little molds that are popping up. You just want to kind of like, you want to like, cuddle with them they're so cute eventually though after patting down and patting down they end up with this more like skin like texture yeah so it's a thin rind all the way around them um some of them and it's not to say good or bad but some of the more industrial cheeses we've seen can have really thick rinds on the outside and they're kind of like forcing this process versus naturally letting it occur and happen um but what we love about them is it creates this amazing texture and flavor profile so the mold derives from Penicillium camemberti. I know you took a deep breath like I was going to let you talk, but I'm not letting you talk yet. That's all right. I'm also inhaling the beautiful aromas okay, that are okay, coming off right. the cheese, so no big deal. Okay, so the mold derives from Penicillium camemberti, camembert being one of the first of this category, and um, it breaks down the proteins that are in the cheese. So when this, this is a brie style here, right here, and when this cheese was really young, if you had cut into it, it would have been, still been chalky in the interior. As it ages out, the rind to paste ratio, rind on the outside, paste in the middle, this mold on the outside breaks down the proteins in the cheese and makes it creamy in this awesome texture. So you have some other iconic cheeses in this category like Humboldt Fog that are more like a birthday cake shape size. It's intentionally that big because they want you to get a little cream line, cream line around the outside under the rind, but also that inner chalky paste texture. So the shape and size does matter, size matters. Yeah, and in this case. And, um, and when you approach a cheese for tasting, it also matters, right? Uh, so a cheese like this, this is all now cream line. The, the way that the, the proteins form this kind of beautiful netting around the fat globules and minerality inside of the, uh, of the milk. And that's what kind of keeps the structure together. And as Kendall mentioned, those proteins start to break apart. Uh, you start to get that sort of um, gooey uh, flavor. Um, that cream line now has been impacted quite a bit by the mold, and then on the rind you've got this intense mold. So when we tell you to approach a cheese like this, what we really recommend is start with that chalky center. If there is one, there would be in this style of cheese because of the height of it. Um, start with that chalkiness. It's going to somewhat resemble the inside of a fresh cheese, right? It'll resemble that milkiness and creaminess. Not too much flavor has come through yet. But then t try the cream line by itself, and that's where you're going to get these cool vegetal notes like uh, broccoli cheese soup, cauliflower, asparagus, mushroom. Um, and then try the rind on its own where you're going to you know, taste mold. It's intense. And then try all three together, and you can just see how those, those flavors really combine to create this beautiful flow from a short, medium, and finished, long, 
finish on your palate. We often get asked, should I eat the rind of this? We'll talk about rind a little bit um, later on. But yes, this is completely edible. We always say give it a bite if totally. you like it, eat it if you don't, don't. Oftentimes to me, it matters what I'm, if I'm drinking like a white wine or a red wine with it or what I'm having with the cheese, it might impact the flavor and either bring out more of that mold on the outside or not. And sometimes when I like these cheeses really aged out, like a little bit past their prime and they're really creamy in the center and they're pretty pungent in a funky way. Um, but the rind at that point can become too aggressive on my palate and over, um, over, overdo it for yeah, what they're for tasting sure. the inside. That being said, don't be the person at the party, y'all, who hollows out the inside. And I can say that because I have been that person before I knew. So if this style of cheeses is at a party, you cut, like, you'll cut a whole pie wedge, you go take it on your plate, eat your little bite. If you don't like that rind, that's fine. You scoop out the insides. But on a cheese platter, you'll want to actually take that cheese the, with the rind because that's part of the cheese. So vegetal broccoli cheese soup, really, next time you have one of these, and that's more of the cow's milk cheeses, the goat's yeah. milk cheeses. You still get more of that tangy acidity. This is one of my favorite um, of the goat milk cheeses. Yeah, and our, our kids, this is actually one of our kids' most favorite cheeses, and this was the first cheese that we had as a, a team when we were real young as a business to celebrate being open. Um, and this comes from the Geochicum Candidum family of um, cheeses. Kind of creates a sort of like brainy mold on the outside. Um, oftentimes you also see a gray coloring on some of these soft ripened cheeses. Uh, and that gray isn't mold, that gray is uh, like a food grade vegetable ash that's used to kind of change the pH so it's not as acidic, it and creates a little more creamy. be added, again in Humboldt Fog, in that case, for beauty, beauty and, and, and a nod to tradition. Uh, um, and then the other little subset of cheeses that lives within this category are the triple cream cheeses. And like double creams, double, double creams and triple creams. And what that is, is when the milk is in the vat, cheesemakers will add extra cream, pure cream, into the milk to increase the butter fat. So I like to say this is as close to butter as cheese is ever gonna get. Super decadent, super rich, super amazing. Um, and, and it matters room temp. You gotta eat it at room temp because just like butter, taking it out of the fridge, it's gonna be cold or then it'll get super soft. So I, I draw it for the first time in forever, but the song that's in my head is, I like the way, way you bloom. Ba -dum -bum. I caught you right when you started singing. I knew where you were going and I loved it. All right, enjoy. T-shirts coming soon. Enjoy your bloomy rhymes, y'all. So now we're moving on to style number three. And you're not here with us right now, which is a bummer, but I can smell them. I, you might be able to smell them through the uh, camera. This is our stinky cheese category. It's my favorite, y'all. Like stinky gym clothes, stinky mm. feet. Like sticky socks. feet, but I like my cheese to smell like it. All this right. This is outstanding. So these are our wash drying category. In our soft ripen video, we just talked about how we're using mold to kind of create this environment on the exterior to protect the inside of the cheese. And in this case, we're using a bacteria called Brevibacterium linens. Uh, you do not have to remember that. Uh, B linens is um, this amazing bacteria that thrives in a sal uh, saline environment that's up to 15% salinity. So it can thrive in lots of different places um, and it's ambient in many places around the world. And so the historical kind of tradition here is that uh, like Benedictine and Cistercian monks um, in their monastery a long, long time ago, they were making the you know breads and wines and beers, olive oils, all these products. All the good stuff. Yeah, all these products uh, that they would then share with the community. And one of the products that they made was cheese. And mold isn't really a great friend to some of those yeast um, products. And so what they would do is they would take some vinegars or salt or alcohol and they wash the outside of the cheeses to kill that uh, any mold growth that was starting to show up. So these are called washed rinds, literally because they are washed Constantly. in a brine or salt solution. You and your visual cue is always these sunset hues. One of our team members said that. I used to say orangey, reddish, pinkish, wettish. That's sunset a lot of ish. Is beautiful. Sunset. We're gonna go with sunset hues. But if it looks like pudgy and creamy, and it's this sunset color hue, chances are it's a wash rind, and they're known for. And then the stink, and once you open up that package and you smell it, you'll get it. And you can see here. Often banned in some yeah, transportation. Totally. <laughs> you can also see on this one a little like tackiness because of it's, they keep the environment really wet for this type of bacteria to thrive. 
and during transit, sometimes they dry out like this one, but you can still see that sunset hue. And some affineurs will choose to, to do both, a combination yeah. of both. Like at one point, this was more wet as well, and then they intentionally have aged it with a little bit of ambient mold allowed to grow over the bee linens. So flavor profiles. Meaty, mm -hmm. bacony, woodsy. Um, There's some could be mustardy, very savory. Yes. Um, and which is great because these are your savory. You know, I love these. Sorry, John. No, love these with savory pairings. So like sweet and tangy mustard seeds and wrapped in a bite of prosciutto on rye bread with mm. pickles. This is like leaning in all the way into your German heritage. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's enough, uh, there's a lot of moisture in this, so you could actually melt it and we make mac and cheese with these um, types of wheels. Uh, but you know, they're really a cheesemonger favorite. You bring it to a party. Everybody's scared of it because it stinks. You take it home and you get to eat it the rest of the night. Um, but we just absolutely love like, you know, this is a special water buffalo version, a lot of cow's milk versions. You start to see sheep milk showing up on the market. Uh, so a wash drying is a really beautiful way to showcase the milk in a unique way. Um, there's cheeses that, you know, Red Hawk is a great example, one of the best cheeses in the country. It was a mistake cheese. It was supposed to be a bloomy rind. Uh, recipe got messed up and it started um, being a great environment for brevi bacteriums that were ambient in that region. And the rest is history. It's an amazing cheese. You and should I, try it. The most well-known aquas, probably, Aquoise. in Langa. So Mark de if you are scared of these cheeses, please visit your local cheese shop and just taste through the case and try different things. Because some of them, we like to say, their bark is louder than their bite, meaning that they'll be more aggressive and stinky on your nose. But on the palate, if you're willing to try it, it's oh so savory and delicious. Some of them also have as big of a bite. Yes. But um, that's for us to know and you to find out. Exactly. Thank Enjoy you your wash drying cheeses, y'all. All right, y'all. So if our last two styles were all about surface ripened cheeses, as in you create um, an environment on the outside that affects the way the inside ages. Now our next style of cheeses, we're on style number four, but four, five, and six are all about their texture, semi-soft, firm, and hard. And a lot of that is about how the cheese is made and how long it's aged, because aging is the controlling moisture loss. So semi-soft are cheeses that you can, This is, everybody is all about texture in this category. And clearly it's quite self-explanatory, but semi-soft, you can bend. They're pliable. They have a lot of elasticity in them. So you can bend them and they won't break. Uh, firm cheeses, you can bend and start to bend them and then they break. And then hard cheeses, you can't bend at all. You just have to crack into them or grate them, and that's because there's no moisture content in them. Bend, that. snap, and crack. That's how, that's, I'm going to use that forever. <laughs> bend, snap, and crack. How is it that we're like over a decade into this business and you've just come up with that? I, you know, rice krispies are on my mind, I guess, it's all, for some reason this morning. It's awesome. And these cheeses are the bendy cheeses. Um, these are your melting cheeses. So one, eat them as they are. This is one of the most popular categories we have in the cheese shop, just because um, people love that texture. They're really, they can be very flavorful, but also considered mild, I think, because they still have some good moisture content in them. Um, and because of that moisture content, that's what makes them ideal for grilled cheese, fondue, um, mac and cheese, any of those things where you want to melt some yummy cheese in. And in fact, we say do a combo to get different flavor profiles from cow's milk cheese to sheep's milk cheese and so forth. And these, as Kendall mentioned a minute ago, we were just talking about surface ripened cheeses, whether it was mold or bacteria. These cheeses also in many ways have bacteria or mold involved, but they're less a definitive part of the cheese than in the previous categories. Yeah, I just little known fact, people will come in and they'll say, I want a cheese without any mold. We know they're talking about blue cheeses, but guess what? Almost all cheese has mold or is impacted by mold or some flavor of mold. Just, you know, yeah. the more you know. It is, and you can see here on this particular wheel, we've got some uh, sort of white mold, brown mold, gray mold. Uh, this is this is what we would call an ambient mold. This is gonna smell like the cheese cave. This is gonna taste like the cheese cave. You know, customers ask us to eat the rind or not. And uh, what, what I like to say is that you bought it, try it. If you like it, keep eating it. I'll say a rind is a stop. terrible thing to waste. No rind left behind. Be kind to your rind. We love the puns. If you have more, 
just add them to this YouTube uh, video. Just keep it going, keep it going. Uh, hit subscribe, you know, all that stuff. That's so, but when it looks like this cheese, this is Oso Irani, one of the first cheeses we knew would carry. And our most popular cheese, basically, over the last 13 years. Yeah, that's because it's, oh, so Irani. Oh my god. Sorry, I love it. it just went there, but that is how I remember the cheese. That was the mnemonic device you helped mm -hmm. me come up with. Sure. Um, but it's it's a sheep's milk cheese with this amazing semi-soft texture. But the rind on the outside, we call these natural rinds. So whenever you see a rind, this one also has a natural rind on the outside that just kind of looks like soil or dirt or cave or whatever euphemism you want to put there. That's just what a cheese naturally looks like as it's aging in caves and you you're wiping it off, you're patting it down, you've already given it maybe, depending on the style of cheese, a little salt on the outside to help rind formation. But there's nothing added to this cheese per se, it's just that's what it starts to look like in certain aging environments. Versus these other styles, which may have gotten a, a paraffin wax um, wrap around, and they'll still grow certain molds on the outside of them, but they'll be able to continue to wipe them off so it doesn't impact the flavor of the inside of the cheese. These natural rinded cheeses definitely give the rind a bite, and if you like it, eat it, and if you don't, don't. Life is too short for any other rules. And the cheese community is pretty split on whether that is part that rind is part of the cheese or not. But I like it because it really adds a bite of that taste of place of where this cheese was aged. Yeah. And some of the classic examples in this category would be like American block cheddar um, or Colby Jack. You know, they have the, quite a lot of moisture in it, so when they melt, they can kind of come apart, but they still hold together perfect for like a cheeseburger or something like that. Um, and at the end of the day, um, these are, from a flavor complexity standpoint, some of the sort of uh, uh, youngest flavors. Um, and so they're really popular because they're friendly. When you're putting out a cheese board, we often think as the, a table cheese, a, 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 a semi-soft cheese like Tom Creus or Oso Arati, who are great examples. Of They're that. also friendly, not only on your palate, but on your hands. Like if you think about service and hospitality, and if you're putting out a cheese board at your house and you want your guests to be able yeah. to cut the cheese, a hard cheese is they really difficult yeah. for people to cut. And so this is one that everybody can easily access. They shouldn't have to use a chainsaw. And I think uh, to wind it up, you like to say about the intent behind the semi-soft cheese, like when the yeah. cheese maker makes so, it. So uh, one of the things we talk about is not every um, semi-soft cheese can be aged out to become a firm or hard cheese because it might have too much moisture. But every hard cheese at one point was semi-soft. Um, and so a cheesemaker, when they're approaching the vat uh, with, a, with milk, has to be very aware of what they want to accomplish in the long run. Um, and you know, the recipe changes, the pH changes. They have to really approach it to make a world-class semi-soft for the for folks to really enjoy it, so I just kind of dig it. It's a great style, and it's it's really fantastic uh, as an everyday eating cheese. And in fact, I think to wrap it up beautifully, it's what they always say is that cheese making is art meets science, and you can follow your exact recipe every day. That's the scientific part. You know how cheese is made, but then depending on what the milk quality is doing or if the curd is set right that way or what you're trying to tweak and make differently, that's part of the art of it. And that's what makes it all so magical. Enjoy the semi sauce. Now we're moving into style number five. This is our firm cheese category. And I absolutely love this category of cheese. It's sort of the largest category that we have in the cheese case. It's the one that you know, over the years we've added more and more and more and more because we have um, some classic cheeses like our uh, cloth-bound cheddars, some alpine style cheeses fall into this like category. Like Comte and Gruyere, we ever had French onion mm. soup, one of those is melted on it, or that make really good fondues. And and some of the, the manchegos that we prefer are more in this firm category of cheese. Um, and the firm cheeses have just kind of exploded and taken over like a quarter of the case over the years. It's and all about the nuance on, yeah. on your palate. Yeah. And so what are firm cheeses? So we've, we've talked about semi-soft cheeses and their meltability and that moisture content. And here what we're experiencing is the cheesemakers taking an approach uh, where they're trying to reduce a significant amount of the moisture uh, because the moisture is enemy of, uh, the enemy of aging. And so uh, the way that cheesemakers typically do this is um, through either cutting the curd, salting the curd, or pressing the curd. And so the way that the cutting happens or is- Or a combination or, of all three. Yeah. Um, and when we talk about the hard cheeses later, that's when they do all of the things as much as they can. 
Um, but cutting the curd is one of the cool ones. So when you're watching a cheese being made and you're watching this liquid vat of milk, within a, like an hour or so, all of a sudden this moment happens where this big old blob of curd rises up from below the liquid whey and forms. And it's just this big, beautiful mass of curd, but it has too much moisture. It's almost like a flan texture or um, those old school jello textures. Yeah, exactly. it up. So you've added your cultures in rennet and the rennet has changed that consistency. Little Miss Muppet sat on her tuppet eating her curds and whey. Making cheese is all about separating the liquids from the solids, curds and whey, um, yeah. getting consolidating those proteins, if you will. And so you've added rennet to jumpstart and transform that milk into that more flan-like texture. Yeah, and th that flan-like texture is great for making fresh cheeses, really uh, moisture-laden um, cheeses. But when you want to age something out, you need to get rid of that. And it's all about creating surface area. So the cheese maker will use either a set of wires or knives or some other special technical uh, piece of equipment that attaches to the cheese vat that just breaks that thing up. And what we're talking about is cutting the curds into like walnut size pieces or all the way down for those hard cheeses like a rice kernel size and what it does that more surface those, area those are actually technical terms those, yeah, we, walnut size curds or rice size curds um, and what that does it creates that more surface area the moisture the way can seep out um, and in that process we're stirring and uh, making sure that we're getting all the curds down to kind of a uniform size and then those curds for say a cheddar like this beauty here will actually get um, piled up on each other within the cheese vat and push out a little bit more moisture naturally. And then uh, that those curds just love to bond together and just they, they immediately try to attract to each other. And then those big old blocks of curds go through a cheese mill that breaks them up into small curds again. Um, and then they get salted right into the vat to kind of halt the rest of that microbial activity uh, as much as possible and then put in a wheel like that. Alpine style cheeses like the one here, um, this, uh, is these are made up uh, tip like the historical context up in the mountains um, where they didn't have access to too much salt but they had access to a lot of wood um, because of the forest and the trees and so they would use heat uh, to get as much of that moisture out of the curd because they could build fires in their pots and so that's so a, dreamy when you talk cheese. I love so, talking cheese. Sorry y'all I've just zoned out here. Was I talking curdy to you? You were again? talking curdy to right. me. Again. And so these um, these styles of this firm style cheese, that amazing table cheeses, they still have enough moisture where you can melt them. Um, they're not as good as the semi-soft that you just heard us talk about. So you can often, come, a, a trick is combine the two, some semi-soft cheeses with some firm cheeses into your fondue, grilled cheese, mac and cheese. That's, um, how we yeah. did, that's how we used to do it down at our kitchen location. Yeah. It's just a little, that pop, big flavor. Because in this, you've had enough time in aging for the protein chains to break down into the more of the amino acids or the, the flavor components of cheese. And so you can get, say like in a Comte, over 112 unique flavor compounds in a wheel of cheese like that, which is just amazing. Yeah, and two other fun facts. I wanted to talk lactose that, and um, fat in cheese. Sure. But fat and cheese, I, I remember learning this like our first year behind the case or something like that. You would, in your brain, assume that these are the more fattening cheeses. Flip flop. The, the, the creamy ones yes. are more fatty. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, because John. Because they're so rich and they're so like decadent. Those have still have so much moisture that it's actually more water content in those. And so it's actually these, which are your better quick sources of protein and fat um, if you're trying to intentionally get those in, into your diet with all those rage diets. And then, and then lactose. And then lactose as a part of the cheese making process goes, the, uh, when you add the starter cultures into the milk, into the vat, they actually are chomping down on the lactose, the sugars in the milk to create lactic acid. You have to have lactic acid in, this, in most cases to make cheese curds and uh, to make that big beautiful blob of curd. And so uh, by the time you get a cheese to about this age, um, there's, al there's almost no trace amounts of lactose left in the cheese. And so, Wait, did y'all yes, hear that? I just Get said on it your soapbox and help us spread it to the world. You can be lactose intolerant and still eat cheese. The process of making cheese is converting lactose into lactic acid, and there's no lactose, if any, just trace amounts that are present in cheese. I'm so sorry, don't compare, I totally jumped in. Don't compare these to a pint of ice cream. And so that's our firm category. It's awesome, and we love it. So 
Try them all and keep tasting. Enjoy. All right, we're on our sixth style of cheeses, otherwise known as hard cheeses. Woo, awesome. Hard cheeses, it's all about, that. imagine this, y'all, the texture, it's hard. But when we talk about hard cheeses, you can, if you pick up your little piece that you might have cut, you can't bend it at all. In fact, if you start to bend it, it will just break. These are a pain in the tushy for cheesemongers to cut behind the case. In fact, you don't even really easily get to cut them. You have when, to crack yeah. into a wheel of parm. When it's in its whole wheel form, you need to sometimes use special tools just to get into it. And you can see from when we cut into this one here, you can see some of the divots from the tools just trying to get into this rind here because it is, you know, the cheesemaker has done everything they can to dry that sucker out with salt, sitting in salt sitting in sunlight maybe. For so you brought up a good point. How, what is aging a cheese? First of all, we know that when we age cheeses, it's not just letting them grow old. Maturation is not the same as getting older. Don't we all wish it? <laughs> We're getting older, but not necessarily maturing, that's for sure. So maturation in caves is all about controlling air temperature, air quality, air flow, air humidity, and based off of what that cheese needs at the time, then you'll introduce it into different sections of your caves or your cellars or your coolers or whatever your unit is that you're using to age in. And you're also flipping them regularly to make sure the moisture rot, it loses moisture at a consistent rate. Yeah, one of the things that I'd like to add about the temperature piece is, right, these wheels of cheese are often really big and they, they, they lose moisture at different rates and at different temperatures. So uh, like a cheese like this one, uh, ages at a much higher temperature. So it loses that moisture and develops flavor much quicker. And so you can be talking about a cheese aging for just tw uh, six months. If it's real small, it becomes real hard or a minimum of two years for other types of cheeses. And in some cases, eight to 10 years, you know, you've got these really long aged cheeses. Something, a, a myth I like to break down, John, in this, John, it's like I'm talking to my husband. Yes. Something I always like to break down with customers is oftentimes they'll come in the case and they always assume more aged is better. That's not necessarily true. It all depends on that specific style of cheese, the flavor profiles you're going for, but you brought up a good, like manchego. You can have a two to four month manchego, which is semi-soft. You can have a six month, which is firmer, or you can have a year plus, which will be hard. Manchego, that style of cheese is actually delicious at every one of those ages, and it's just what you prefer. Parmigiano Reggiano, if you cut into this cheese when it was really young, it would have no flavor. It actually needs that full two years to mature and develop the flavor profile that they want to call it a name controlled cheese. Name controlling, which we've talked about, meaning that it has to meet all of these specifications and regulations to be have that stamp of approval and protect that local economy that it's actually a Parmigiano Reggiano. So we have an aged Gouda, we have our Parmigiano Reggiano. One thing that is all about aged cheeses is Tyrosine. Yum, yum, yum. Flavor crystals. So people come in, they're like, I want a cheese with flavor crystals. We know that they're talking about tyrosine. The little crunchy bits in the back of your mouth when you just, it's like pop rocks of happiness. People think it's salt added in, and it's not. I mean, there is a type of crystallization that often occurs on aging cheddars called calcium lactate. But these crystals and aged cheeses, which you can see in this little white pocket on this Gouda, this is not mold. It is actually a little clump of crystals. It's tyrosine are these little breakdowns in the amino acids in the cheese, and it happens as a result of aging. So what are we doing when we age cheese? Controlling moisture loss, trying to get that moisture to evenly drain out. Something that we didn't talk about either is that there are people in the cheese industry and their whole job is just to age cheese. So they aren't the dairymen and herdsmen taking care of the animals. They aren't the cheese makers. They are affineurs, and their whole goal is to go purchase wheels of cheese that they like, they'll knock on them, they'll listen to them, they'll look for signs of defects, but they'll say, okay, I'm gonna adopt this cheese, bring it into my special aging caves with my special terroir, or sense of place that can't be replicated anywhere else, and I'm gonna help mature this baby into everything it's meant to be. And that's the whole job of an affineur. And so I just love it that old cheese is not the way to go. Cheese that's matured to the perfect state you can eat, just put this out, and it should have, in theory, this is not true in all cases, but the longest finish on your palate. So these are ones to really let them come to room temperature before you eat them, because the aroma compounds are gonna open up and it's gonna create more of that sensation of flavor. And then once you eat, smell it, put it on your palate, 
Crack taste it. it and savor it. And then once you swallow it, sit there and how long is the finish? You can even play a game and count it out. But really your goal is to taste, it's gonna keep changing on your palate and fully develop. And that's the beauty of an aged cheese. And in a, from a service perspective, as you approach these types of cheeses, we often get asked about the rinds. Um, and we've talked about it already. Uh, but you can see on a cheese like this, it's a very thick, very dry rind. So in most part, most cases here, it's very toothsome. So you might wanna cut it off and actually use it in a soup. This is just dried bits of cheese uh, protein and fat. So using it in a, a soup stock or a, a tomato sauce is a fantastic approach. Uh, approach. But this is also uh, great cheese for just a table cheese and of course for grating. These cheeses are exceptional for grating. And I think the only other thing to mention is color can become more pronounced as a cheese ages out. So oftentimes the more yellow or um, straw hued it is, it means that that animal, it's likely a raw milk cheese and that animal was eating, um, it was pasture fed or pasture grazed while that milk was used to make that cheese. Um, goat's milk cheeses, when they're aged out, they're usually bright white, no matter. Um, sheep's milk cheeses will be ivory and then cow's milk can really reflect that yellowy um, color profile. So if you can't, and if whenever you have leftovers, Perfect. these, by the way, when people say, I found this old piece of cheese in my fridge, what do I do with it? Other cheeses, um, it depends. Usually you can just knock off the style, the the mold on the outside. Fresh, younger cheeses, it's really, you probably need to pitch them. Pitch it, yeah. But these are the kinds that you can still use, make into soups and stocks, make a fromage for it, grate them on top of grilled veggies and drizzle it in a little olive oil. So these are the ones that, because there's no moisture in them or really low amounts of moisture, um, are great to so still good. eat anytime. So enjoy our hard cheese selection. All right, y'all, we are on to uh, category seven. We've almost done it. It's the last Woo! one. Blue cheeses, oftentimes the most um, divisive of the cheeses. This is the last cheese that we will serve guests when we're giving free samples because- Why is that, John? Well, it's the flavor profile can linger on your palate. You know, some of these suckers can like, once you taste it, can like, feel like a punch in the stomach and leave you in the gutter for a couple hours because it's such a strong, bold, in intense an awesome way. flavor. Yeah, you want that feeling, it's good. And so we often start, uh, well, you we always start in the order that we just uh, recorded the videos, fresh all the way to blue and um, With blue our cheeses. tastings, and that's because it's a progression of ages and or flavors yeah. and what will linger on your palate. So if somebody walks in the shop and they're like, I just want that blue cheese. We'll do everything we can to beg them to try other things first, only because every other thing they taste is gonna taste like blue cheese afterwards. And some of those big aggressive flavors we just talked about though, that's what people think of when they think mm -hmm. of blue cheese, but actually the nuance and the variety, in fact, there are different styles of blue cheeses. Hundreds and hundreds of variations of flavor profile within this. I would say, you know, two of the most common, you know, there's the piquant family of blue cheeses. Like? Real spicy, kind of on your palate, they're intense. Peppery, tickles the back of your yeah. throat, it's piquant, it wakes you up, it yeah. triggers something. Rope four, for instance. Um, then there's the style that's more of a cooling blue, so it sort of like, tastes like cream and mellows out your palate, and it's, oh yeah, the, the little happy dance. Um, so, I'm going, but, but a good example of that is there's gorgonzola picante, meaning that age, or gorgonzola naturale, it's aged out, and it has that spice and kick to it, or there's gorgonzola dolce or gorgonzola verde, meaning sweet or green, and it's just that it's a younger version, it's a creamier version, and that scooped and dolloped into pears on a grill, drizzled in honey, you may not even know it's a blue cheese. So how do we get to a blue cheese? So this is a mold uh, ripened cheese, but it's ripened from the inside out. So during the make process, cheese maker will actually add, most often, penicillium row 40 into the milk and it's there and it's it's alive and it's living, but it's an aerobic mold. So it needs actually oxygen to thrive and grow. Um, so you can, on the outside of some of these ones, you can actually see where the oxygen has uh, started to create this blue, green, um, parsley type color profile uh, because it's activated by the oxygen. Um, but in order to get that blue cheese experience into the inside. They to actually, get it to vein, to so it we to call vein. these veins. And in this cheese, it's awesome. You can actually see the lines. These are striations. They actually use needles. Um, they puncture the outside of the cheese to create these sort of um, uh, striations 
um, and pockets of air, and that's when the blue mold really thrives. So they're not injecting blue mold into it, they're literally just creating air pathways to allow that oxygen to go in and hit the mold that's already present, which allows it to vein and develop blue, green, yellow, all different colors of mold striations. And in fact, we have an example of a blue cheese here. You may have had one before in your life. You can see there's no blue veining in here, no coloring. It's only on the outside. Well, that cheese was never pierced, so it didn't allow that veining to develop in the inside of the paste. And that's but it very, is a blue cheese. Very intentional. And any time that there's a blue mold component to a cheese, we consider that to be the most defining characteristic, and it sort of ends up in this car uh, category. Um, and so these would be considered your gateway blues. So if you're a little bit afraid of blue, there's two things you can do. Start with the gateway blues, very either not pierced or lightly pierced. And a spoonful of honey makes the blues go down. That's right. What often chase it. our cheesemongers will chase it with a little bit of honey. And after a few short weeks of doing that, all of a sudden they love the blues. And then there's uh, two other sort of distinctions that you might want to consider. One is uh, this kind of... Um, uh, wheels of cheese that don't have too much um, rind to them. They sort of it's a continuation of the inside of the cheese. And they're often aged in foil or wrapped in foil mm -hmm. and travel in foil so that other things aren't growing around and on it. Or, or these beautiful ambient natural rinded cheeses that allow this secondary level of complexity to develop within the blue cheese. Love so, a natural rinded blue. It's one of so my favorites actually. Yeah. And there's a, uh, can be cheeses that have a lot of moisture in them, like this Roquefort is real creamy, or the moisture is allowed to escape. And so blue cheese is really dynamic and fun, and typically uh, it's a great to have as like a topping on a salad and as an ingredient, but also really because of the vast variety of blue cheeses, it's excellent as a table cheese. Just have it out, sitting out for a few hours, and you that weird piece of cheese will just go away as you just walk by every few minutes. And, and, at, and in the world of pairings, we love, because cheese, blue cheese can be salty, we love sweet things on it. So a cajeta or a dulce de leche, like a caramel sauce. We pair chocolate with blues, as you said, honeys. Um, fresh fruit will always go. Traditionally, a port and sherry or even... Um, like a triple beer, so you get that like butter, butter gum flavor. Yeah. Um, so we're trying to pair some of that softness and sweetness um, with the blue cheese. So good. You're gonna love it. So enjoy the blues, have fun with it, and um, yeah, come into the case and try as many as you can. Woohoo, we did it, y'all! awesome. You have just done a cheese tasting. We hope you had fun. We hope you learned something, but most importantly, had fun. And just have a full belly of happiness right now. That's yeah. what we want most of all. And if you want to do another cheese tasting with us or one of our other tastings of cured meats or honeys or other chocolates and goodies, we hope you'll join us for one of those. And just thank you for giving artisanal food a chance. Thank you for loving and appreciating these makers as much as we do. And thanks for being a part of our mission to do good, eat good. We appreciate y'all.